You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics. Wait, welcome back from Music Tectonics? We are back from the Music Tectonics Conference. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm also the CEO and founder of Rock, Paper, Scissors. And we had such an amazing time just a couple of weeks ago in Santa Monica, California, the Los Angeles area at the Music Tectonics Conference. For all our amazing podcast listeners who were able to come out and make it for the event, thank you so much. It was great to meet so many people in person, to see people again, and to enjoy such a great spot. I thought I would just take a few minutes uh, this episode myself. I guess maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll do 20 minutes here on the conference itself. This is just a a one-person podcast, something we haven't done in a long time, if ever, where I thought I would just kind of share some notes, some things that I'm thinking about. I'm starting to listen to the archives from the sessions And uh, we're starting to see if we can maybe get some of those uh, panels up as podcast episodes as well. Um, But just some things that stood out for me for this episode. So as probably most of our listeners know, we had a three-day event, October 25th to 27th. Each day was a different venue, a different experience. And so some of the report back uh, is actually hard to, hard to recap because we were at a carousel at the Santa Monica Pier, which was awesome. We had demos from, I think, about 20 different companies at the carousel itself. They were just showing off what startups they had in the music tech world. Lots of networking. We had our our food truck there. We had tacos and and a bar and and drinks, a party sponsored by Sound Exchange, but a super great way to get things started. The bulk of our programming was actually the second day at the Lowe's Santa Monica Hotel, and that's what I thought I might report back on. I've been digging through the archives. We had a a bunch of different panels. We had, I think, 15 panels at the conference all over the the map in terms of topics. The keynote that kicked us off was by Mahan Zanuzi, the head of innovation at Spotify. And I think uh, we heard a lot during the panels and just around the event during networking. Uh, It was a great, Mahan really brought a a great topic that kind of set the context. Um, Mahan was talking about how music for him was always a beacon of culture and kind of established all the things around identity for youth whether it was clothing or how we talk and, and how, you know, our, our values and so forth. He's talked about his own upbringing, listening to first punk rock and then hip hop and how that influenced culture. And it was interesting because we certainly had um, topics, panels on gaming and music. And Mahan has an interesting perspective about gaming uh, in that he was sort of suggesting that we not think solely in terms of getting music into games, just because gaming is such a big part of culture now, but that all of us that are in the music space, the music industry, the field, the create the creative sonic world, uh, have an important thing to consider, which is that music is starting to lose some of its strength as a beacon of culture. And he, he uh, brought up a lot of different kind of stories around around that, and that it's not solely that we need to get music into gaming so much, but that he was suggesting that we need to, as a music industry, take back the role of leadership in creating identity and meaning, that music has to become the most relevant uh, source for identity for, for youth, um, in a way that gaming is starting to do now, social media did, gaming has done. He says it'll happen a lot with Web3 as well as that emerges. Um, but it was kind of a, a broader, it, it wasn't very tactical. It wasn't like, here's the things we need to do, follow these 10 steps. It was more like thinking bigger. Basically, Mahan was asking us as a music industry to think bigger. And I think it really struck a chord. He's very, very humorous. Lots of great anecdotes um, there. Um, but it did kind of set the tone for a lot of the conversation. For one, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't just disruptive. It was, it was just sort of mind-bending. <laughs> Mahan had us doing some mind-bending, and we saw that come out in a lot of the other panels as well. So, in fact, I did listen to the archive of the Gaming is the New Venue panel, 
And that was super interesting, especially having heard the keynote because it had a different perspective. These are folks that are already heavily engaged with that overlap of music and gaming. So whereas Mahan was saying, let's step out before we dive fully into gaming uh, and, and look at just how important music should be for people. These are folks that have already dived deep into gaming and are using the platform of gaming to expand music and vice versa. And uh, uh, Gavin Johnson from Monster Cat was on that panel. I remember Remember, he spoke a lot that they treat the a game like Rocket League like it's a like it's almost like another DSP like Spotify. It's another distribution space for people to listen to and engage with music. Um, he also pointed out that they Rocket League themselves have A and R people, and so a lot of gaming companies are thinking like the record labels. Um, Riot Games has been investing in artists and marketing artists as if they're a, a record label. And of course, Karen, Karen Allen was the moderator of that panel. And she pointed out how Twitch gamers um, use this technique that I've heard her describe before, raiding, which is basically when you finish your Twitch stream, you can just go and bring your audience to a whole other stream. And so sometimes music uh, performers, artists are getting an influx of the gaming community too. So super interesting to hear about culturally what's happening on a platform like Twitch that's actually raising the audience and discovery possibilities for artists as well. Of course, they had conversations about the challenging parts of gaming, the biggest one being, uh, I think, licensing music and how to handle all the, the, the splits in terms of the rights on the songwriting composition side. But Gavin also pointed out that convincing artists that gaming is a legitimate space for this type of uh, partnership or for licensing in itself was a, another challenge too. So lots of really interesting conversations there. Now, um, Karen, the, the moderator, Karen Allen, did bring up the question about NFTs. And interestingly, contrary to what you might think if you're outside of the gaming world, there's a lot of folks in the gaming world who are not partial. They're a bit resistant to the idea of NFTs. Um, and uh, and there was a conversation, I think it was Summer on the on the panel, who said that, the solution is to make the game fun first. That it, the the NFT is just the the business model. It's not the it's not the uh, the whole point of all of it. And so you have to make the game fun first, and then you can address things around the uh, the business model and whether N NFTs are involved. That was Summer Watson from WYE Media Company had some great stuff to say there as well. Um, you know, the the Q and A came up. Somebody asked about well, how do you you know, if you're an independent artist, how do you get involved? I mean, is, is this out of reach? Do you have to have big budgets to do deals with big games? And Gavin came back and said that a lot of the larger gaming companies are investing in more and more independent games themselves. And, and those independent games, they want to make their games cool with great music too, but they might not have the budgets for, for big labels and, and big artists. So reaching out to indie developers is a great way for smaller labels or indie artists to get involved in gaming. And interestingly, Karen Allen left a uh, left a little dangle dangling uh, concept at the end of the panel she didn't have time to address but she said TikTok games is a sleeping giant so look into it so uh, <laughs> that was some of the cool things that came out of that gaming panel we actually had a lot of um, content around the metaverse as well in particular um, the fireside chat with uh, the head of sound exchange Michael Huppy was a great playful fun conversation just sort of like spitballing about what does the the future of the metaverse look like for music one of his overall points that i found super engaging was he posed the idea that the metaverse might be narrower but deeper than a lot of the platforms and the ways in which people have dealt with music up to now you know sound exchange very involved with the the um you know the, the the payouts related to the use of digital music and they've been expanding as a calling themselves a music tech company uh to help um, to help creators. Uh, and uh, what I think his point was, you know, a lot of the, the evolution of the streaming platforms have been that you want millions of tracks. You want a one, one place to go to. Not his words, but the celestial jukebox is there. Um, but that he sees the, the possibility that metaverse communities may emerge that are very specific, maybe to a specific scene, a specific genre, or maybe specific artists. And so you might not need to license millions of tracks. And that allows you to, ha again, have a narrower but deeper approach to music and fan engagement. And he also said that there will be new rights, but even the, the current rights pie is going to grow. Because if you think it about everything in IRL in terms of music rights and music usage now, 
there, you know, there's not payouts for everything. Uh, of course, he pointed to radio in America where the performer and the label don't get paid. In the metaverse, that'll change because that will now be a, a, a different digital format. And, uh, and so there'll be an opportunity for more payouts there. And of course, why is Sound Exchange talking about this stuff? They're very involved with millions and billions of transactions uh, in music and helping to uh, get rights holders paid. And so, um, you know, the conversation certainly circled around the idea that Sound Exchange could help other, um, you know, as, as these metaverse platforms emerge, other ways of, of paying out creators and, and rights holders. So, so uh, he also talked about uh, artists and creators being needing to be a part of that conversation now. So as the metaverse platforms emerge, you can't really make commerce flow well if the right people aren't being compensated. That was that was what uh, Mike said there. Uh, there was also chat about the importance of interoperability and the challenge to walled gardens uh, when it, as it re- regards with intellectual property. Um, you know, if you buy something in one metaverse space, you want to be able to use it somewhere else. Um, and, you know, that's certainly been one of the challenges with the NFT world now is you, you've got a thing, but what do you do with it now? Especially if the whole speculative value share uh, grow, uh, growth potential of it no longer exists, um, you want to be able to use it somehow. Um, so that was an interesting one. I mean, one, one last comment. I remember he was talking about a friend's uh, niece, I think it was, and said there are 10-year-olds out there who've already been to their first concert but it's been in the metaverse. So whereas we're, you know, we're thinking about what does that live concert feel look like? There are people who already envision that the metaverse is exactly that, that it's the exact same thing. So let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I'll, uh, I'll hit a couple other interesting things that I've heard. Whoa, the ideas are flying fast on this episode. If you want to follow up on anything we're talking about today, we've made it easy. Head over to musictectonics.com and find this episode on the podcast page. You'll see show notes full of links and a timestamped roadmap of the conversation. We're not responsible for internet rabbit holes you tumble down in the process. Now, let's get back to the conversation. All right, we're back. And uh, I'm just sort of sharing some highlights from some of the archives that I've dug into from the Music Tectonics Conference uh, that took place a couple of years. I think I'll I'll hit a couple of more here. Um, one one of the best panels I think in terms of startups listening would be the Music Tech Investment Panel, which we do every year at the conference, where we gather some of the investors who are directly involved with funding music tech startups. This was a cool one. Rishi Patel from Plus Eight Equity Partners was there. Uh, Joe Toe from Sony Ventures was there, and someone we haven't had at the conference before, Bruce Hamilton from Mech Ventures. It's a new VC that focuses on uh, investing in tech related to pop culture. And that was, uh, that was moderated by Tiffany Yu from Parametric Capital. What I loved about this panel, we definitely got some specific tips from an investor perspective, but also all these folks just seem so informed, not just about um, investment or in music tech, but really about the music industry and the future and, and the vision there. Um, I think, you know, Joe from Sony just kicked it off by talking about they think in terms of the future of entertainment. So so they're not specifically a music investor, but they look at a lot of crossover for the tech needs of gaming, entertainment, sports, and music. Um, so that was kind of interesting just to hear these different investors' sort of perspectives, um, not quite their, their thesis in each case, but uh, you, you got a flavor for it. Um, Rishi was quick to point out that if you're a VC and you don't understand music rights, copyright publishing, you shouldn't be investing in music startups. That was refreshing to hear because we've seen so many technology companies emerge that then face how do they deal with rights holders and and payouts and licensing and and that sort of thing much, much later in the process. Um, Bruce, uh, again, he talked about investing in the intersection of pop culture and tech. And he, he, he had a couple of great phrases. Pop culture evolved technology and vice versa was one. And he also said technology is the vehicle that drives evolution in society and connects people from all walks of life, which was pretty interesting. But many times in the panel, he referred back to this idea that you have to walk among the people to understand what the future is going to look like. And that was a cool, um, I think, a cool perspective to hear about a lot. Another interesting thing, uh, Tiffany had asked a question about what maybe what music tech specific investors um, 
know versus what generalist VCs can do. And Joe talked about how generalist VCs can't know everything. And that as you dig into specific card categories deeper and deeper, you find out more, not less. I think that's, we find that a lot with niches. We've certainly found that at Rock, Paper, Scissors. The more we've dug in as a PR firm for music tech companies, it's just like a rabbit hole. It just opens up more possibilities, not fewer possibilities, which is kind of counterintuitive, I think. Rishi talked about music being such a tight-knit industry and, and that if you're an outsider, it's, it's hard to gain trust. And uh, that, was, that was interesting to think about. I think it was related to Bruce's comments about the, the um, you know, walking among the people and, and the role of, of understanding pop culture to understand where things are going and things like that. The, the broad level picture that these investors had on the lar- larger society and culture was super interesting to me. Um, <clears throat> Joe pointed out that what we just went through was the only time in history that all humans had to change forcibly across the world, of course, meaning the pandemic, and that as a result, there was this need for expression and community that that came out. And uh, he talked about the convergence of this isolation of the pandemic, which led to things like just everyone being on video conferencing, FaceTime, online collaboration, playing together online. It, it really led to what he said was the, the game environments became really successful very quickly. And that led to a change in behavior across society. And, uh, and so that was kind of an interesting thought of, of sort of why, you know, there was so much conversation about gaming and the metaverse at the conference, not, you know, regardless of what the panels were, but just the, the fact that it was on, on everybody's mind was because there was this moment where they were kind of well established they were at the right place at the right time for that social isolation in a way that music had to adapt to but gaming was very ripe for it and of course sony uh is on the video gaming side as well as music so um certainly a um, an apt uh observation from somebody that's that uh immersed in that part of the world too there was a lot of conversation on the panel too uh the concept of web 2.5 came up a couple of times versus web 3 there was a conversation about how nfts are not user friendly and that you may need the cutting edge blockchain technology for for future proofing but if it's there in a way that users don't even know about it, it's actually better. There was conversation about putting your feet in the shoes of the user to see what their pain points are. And this concept of Web 2.5 is that the the infrastructure is there for Web 3, but it's not necessarily obvious to users. You kind of have to build a build a um, build a bridge to to where people will actually have a w- awareness of it later it's not as critical that they know about it but that they can use it easily rishi also pointed out that there are these uh, no code tools emerging for artists to build their own fan based metaverses and uh, uh, Fabian Al Sultani was in the conference uh, audience and, and during the Q&A it just asked directly. And I figured this would be useful for those of you startups who are talking to investors and VCs. Um, he asked, what range checks do people write? Uh, Joe at Sony Ventures said they have actually two different strategies. One is early stage um, checks in the range of 500000 to $2 million. And then they have, I think it's another, it might be another fund that for mid or late uh, companies further along will do single digit millions up to series A, B, C, and D as well. So they have the opportunity to invest further down the road. Plus eight, Rishi from Plus eight uh, Equity Partners uh, said they they write checks from a few hundred K to millions. And Mech uh, Ventures, Bruce Hamilton said they're at pre-seed, typically writing checks at $100,000. So that was uh, some of the highlights from the Music Tech Investment Panel. Um, I think coming to the Music Tectonics Conference and having the opportunity to be there in the audience, ask those questions, to follow up afterwards. I know Joe had the experience of literally having had to spend another 90 minutes after the panel was over just talking to folks. I'm sure Rishi and Bruce and Tiffany had similar experiences. So make sure make sure when we announce our dates next year, startups, you come out to the conference because this is a, a really cool opportunity and this was a great curated group of investors. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I want to hit one more panel that we had called Collaborative Creation with Fans. Again, I'm not handpicking panels based on anything other than just starting to listen through the archives and helping to pull out some of the cool things that came out. This was a panel that was moderated by Tatiana Sirisano from Media Research, who actually spoke a few times at the conference. She gave a couple of amazing keynotes, one with Chris Thakar from also from Media and one on her own, which was great. But she moderated a panel, which is super fun to see, with uh, Daniel Rowland from Lander, head of strategy and partnerships there, Michael C. Slack from uh, Basenote, one of the co-founders there, and Emma Supika, who's the art education lead at Artifon, the uh, creators of the Orba. So this was a fun conversation to have so many different perspectives on collaborative creation with fans. I mean, they talked about everyone being a creator at this point, which is kind of interesting. It's that blurring of lines between the artist and the fan who, you know, as everyone becomes a creator, I think it was Daniel who mentioned that there's just a change in expectation. When you go to a concert, you are an active participant. You're taking videos and you instantly become a creator as a way, uh, in a way as well there. Um, but they also talked a little bit about, you know, the way that people use playlists in itself is, is different than the way it used to be. It used to make maybe make a mixtape every once in a while. And now you really create your identity through these playlists with the goal of um, music for certain moments or moods or ways to express peace yourself or give us gifts and so forth. And so Daniel also talked about curation is a type of creation and talked about how DJ culture, the influence of DJ culture has really changed how people think about creativity and their their engagement their their involvement the interaction of that aspect where you're not just a uh, lean back listener but really somebody that's creating stuff and that that's really influenced norms of fan engagement they also talked about the relationship between the evolution of technology to allow for more of that engagement from from fans to be less passive as well can't remember who it was on the panel but they talked about generate uh, kind of like the gen z folks over indexing on participation i think emma from artifong was talking about that quite a bit as well and as a result artists are starting to put out unfinished songs for feedback it's kind of a, a productivity hack where instead of making what you think will be the perfect song or guessing what will be the perfect song but instead you actually put out a song that's still in process and then as a result of the feedback you get from your fans you decide where to go with it next maybe getting feedback maybe having collaborators from out there in the world as well and we're starting to see some interesting trends along this line some of it is uh, how you monetize collaboration certainly we saw with cameo um, where artists were making a uh, a shout out to specific fans and and uh, getting custom content as a result uh, being big during the pandemic, but also it's kind of a gamification of music making is emerging is what the panel said too. I will say one last piece from that panel it wasn't the focus necessarily, but it was it was kind of a, a helpful thing for me to hear again from Daniel Roland from from Lander was putting out this idea that artificial intelligence creation tools will eventually create more artists who will then become more like quote professional artists they'll they'll for, for example he's a he's an a sound engineer so he thinks that those ai tools will help people make their first music and as they get better and take on more of the music creation themselves they'll end up hiring him for mastering or using tools like what lander has and, and so forth so he doesn't see ai to creation tools as a threat so much as it is a um, an opportunity for people to first get started in the music space, um, creating music. Anyway, that's just a handful of the panels that we heard at Music Tectonics. There was so much more than just the panels. We're actually hoping to be able to air some of those panels. We, we need to get permissions on that and make sure the audio is good and so forth. I'm curious to hear from you. What would you like to hear from the Music Tectonics Conference? Are there specific panels or talks you'd like us to try to broadcast this podcast? Do me a favor. Email us at conference at musictectonics.com. That's conference at musictectonics.com. And let me know if there's any, you can go, you can still go to musictectonics.com slash schedule and see what some of the panels were. Were there any things you were hoping to hear from there? Um, and uh, thanks to everyone who filled out surveys from the conference. It was so great to get your feedback. Amazing, amazing, positive vibes from everybody. Um, we're so glad we were able to create such a fantastic, fun experience. We're really glad that there were no fires like we had in 2019 and the weather was beautiful. And we had such a great time meeting with everybody whether it was at the Carousel or at Expert Dojo or out at the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica. We had such a great time with everybody. Um, we're already starting to think about next year, so uh, 
as soon as we announce those dates, make sure to get them on your calendar. If you miss this year, whew, it's going to be even better next year, but don't, mix, don't miss another one. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back with more from the conference and more from the podcast soon. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know you can dig deeper into all our episodes with the show notes at musictectonics.com. While you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference, sign up for our newsletter to get updates, or get the Music Tectonics app for Music Tech News. Everything we do explores seismic shifts that shake up music and technology the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and find me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it, on LinkedIn. Bye-bye! You're listening to Music Tectonics.